We do come now to God's Word this morning. We're continuing forward in our, our series in Luke's Gospel. Uh, this morning we are in Luke chapter 16, uh, reading together verses 16 through 18. So I invite you to turn with me in your copy of God's Word or in the Pew Bible in front of you uh, to Luke chapter 16. And we'll read together verses 16 through 18. Let's give our attention now to the reading of God's Word. The law and the prophets were until John. Since then, the good news of the kingdom of God is preached, and everyone forces his way into it. But it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one dot of the law to become void. Everyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery, and he who marries a woman divorced from her husband commits adultery. Brothers and sisters, this is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. O oh, merciful Father, as we come now to this word from the Gospel of Luke, Lord, to your word, we understand and we acknowledge that it comes as a difficulty to us. In some ways, it is a difficult saying. And so, Father, we do pray that you would soften our hearts to receive it that you would open our hearts to receive it, that you would allow us to hear it through the lens of the, the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. Speak to our hearts, Lord. Bring comfort where we need comfort. Bring conviction where we need conviction. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, for the second time now, in two weeks, we have before us a, a topic of of great confusion and controversy as it pertains to the Christian life. Last week we heard Christ teaching on the topic of finances, of financial stewardship, how Christians are supposed to steward the money that the Lord has entrusted to them, what it means to be a generous and a faithful steward. And lest we think that we are about to get a reprieve from difficult topics, we find this morning that our text... In this text, our Lord and Savior's teaching on the, to on the topic, on the subject of divorce and remarriage. This might leave us wondering, why is Jesus being so controversial? Why is he getting into our business? Why is he prying into such a sensitive, personal, private matter? Why is he exploring the, the dark corners of my life? Why does the teaching of Christ often take me to places in my life that I don't want to go? I would propose to you the, the following reason. It's because Christ cares about your heart. Christ cares about your heart. And so in his love for his disciples, he presses into difficult, sensitive areas of discipleship because he knows that these are the matters that are closest to our hearts. That's what we've seen over the past two weeks. What two topics get more at the heart of who we are as human beings? What two topics inspire more emotion and feeling than the topics of money and marriage? Money and marriage get right into our hearts because both of these topics, money and relationships, they get at two of the, the basic fears and insecurities that are common to humans. Two basic fears, two basic insecurities. On the one hand, will I be provided for? And on the other hand, will I be loved Will I be provided for? Will I be loved? Uh, on the one hand, oftentimes our greatest fear is, what if I don't have enough? What if I don't have enough money? What's going to happen to my financial security in this economy? Am I going to lose the house? Will I have something for my children? Will I have something to leave my children? We fear for provision. On the other hand, we have the, the great fear, what if the person I love the most betrays me? What if my spouse leaves me? What if I never find somebody to marry? What if I have sinned against my spouse? Am I irredeemable? Am I damaged goods? Will anyone ever love me again? What if I'm left all 
alone. You see, Christ speaks into these uncomfortable areas in our lives because these are the areas where we need the good news of his gospel the most. These are the areas in which we oftentimes carry the most shame, the most emotional baggage, the most pain. You see, Jesus does not shy away from these sensitive areas of our lives because these are the exact areas where we need him the most. I'm going to say that again. Jesus does not shy away from these sensitive areas in our lives because these are the areas where we need him the most. When we fear for lack of provision, we need to hear him declare to us that because of his death and resurrection, we are free from a love and service to money. We need to hear the promise of the eternal generosity of his grace. We need to hear the call to respond to that generosity by freely giving back to him that which he's free, first freely given to us. Doing so in faith that he will give us exactly what we need. And this morning, as we come to this text, and as we face a world of relational insanity, where, where so many are carrying with them a heavy burden, the heavy burden of broken relationships, broken marriages, unmet expectations, we need to hear the voice of our Savior declaring to us what is true, declaring to us what is true from His Word. We need to hear Him pointing us back to His good design for marriage. We need to hear Him in the midst of our sin, in the midst of our shame, directing our hearts back to the healing balm of His gospel. And so within the context of this sensitive topic of, of marriage and divorce, I want us to look to two questions that our passage answers. Two questions that our passage answers for us. First, what is the good news of the gospel for our marriages? What is the good news of the gospel for our marriages? And second, how does the good news of the gospel apply to our marriages? What is the good news of the gospel and how does it apply to our marriages? So first, we begin where Christ begins here. Christ begins by making an important theological distinction about the gospel for his hearers in verse 16. And remember, at this point, Jesus is still speaking to the Pharisees and the scribes. They had interjected themselves into the conversation. He's, he's correcting their understanding of what it means to be a faithful follower of God. He's used the example of money. The Pharisees scoffed at this because they were lovers of money. And he's about to use the example of marriage because they're getting that wrong too. But before he gets there, he needs to make a crucial distinction, an important theological distinction. And this is a distinction between the law and the gospel. The distinction between the law and the gospel. The law is what God commands what he prescribes, what he requires. It is his good design for this world. And the gospel is what God promises, what he gives freely because of Jesus Christ. Now why is he making this distinction here between the law and the gospel? Because he wants these Pharisees and because he wants everybody gathered around listening to understand very clearly how are we as humans supposed to relate to God? How are we as human beings supposed to relate to God? Do we relate to God on the basis of the law or do we relate to him on the basis of the gospel? Or to say it another way, do we relate to God on the basis of his commands or on the basis of his promises? Are we supposed to relate to God by obeying him or by believing his promises. Look at what Jesus says in verse 16. He begins to answer that question for us. He says, the law and the prophets were until John. Since then, the good news of the kingdom of God is preached. Here's what Jesus is saying. 
He is saying that, yes, there, there was a time where it appeared as if God related to his people on the basis of his law, on the basis of his commandments, on the basis of his requirements, the time that he calls here the law and the prophets, the time up to the ministry of John the Baptist, the time before Christ came. When Christ came, he came to clearly demonstrate and preach the good news of the kingdom of God which is the good news that we cannot keep the law of God in our sin. And in fact, the law was meant to always to point us to who Jesus Christ would be as our Lord and Savior. That's the good news of the kingdom, that we, we cannot keep the law of God in our sin. And so God became a man to keep the law for us perfectly and to take the penalty that our sins deserve on the cross. That's why Christ came. He came to demonstrate and preach the good news that he has fulfilled every requirement of the law and the prophets for God's people, for his people, for all who trust in him by faith. And so the message of the gospel that Christ came to preach is not obey the law in order to please God and earn his favor. The message of the gospel is not obey the law in order to please God and earn his favor. The message is, come to God on the basis of his promise. Come to God on the basis of his gracious promise to save you by faith in his son. Believe the promise. Trust the promise. And God will give you salvation as a gift of his grace. Your sins will be completely forgiven, covered, covered over, gone, because of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Come to God by believing his promises, not by keeping commandments. This is the good news of the kingdom that Jesus is talking about here. Now, how in the world does any of this have anything to do with marriage, divorce, and remarriage? Why are we taking all this time to talk about the gospel, to clarify the gospel? Why does Jesus take this time here? Why don't we just get to the point? It's a good question. It's because of this. It's because the gracious promises of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, the gracious promises of the gospel are the only way that we can face the reality of what the Bible teaches about marriage and divorce and the reality of our own marital sin and brokenness without shame and without fear. The gospel is the only way that we can face those realities without shame and without fear because the gospel lets us look at the reality of what the law teaches clearly. It lets us look at what the requirements of the law are clearly, realizing it exposes our sin and then feel no condemnation because there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And nowhere is this topic more Important. Nowhere is this more important than in this topic of marriage, divorce, and remarriage. Because admittedly, so many people are carrying with them the shame, the regret of broken marriages. The shame, the regret, the, the pain of being a child of a broken marriage. The shame and regret of how they've sinned in their marriages or how they've sinned against their spouse in their marriage. And we face two temptations when we see this reality. On the one hand, the temptation is to try to use moral obedience to, to the law. Moral obedience as a way to redeem ourselves, as a way to cover over our sin to try to climb out of the, the pit of, of, of sin and shame, to try to climb out of that pit through moral obedience to God's law. Thinking that perhaps good moral behavior in my current marriage makes up for all the bad things that happened in my previous marriage. That's the temptation of legalism. Or on the other hand, we can use the, the gospel, we can use a cheap understanding of grace as a way to redefine or even reject what the Bible says about divorce and remarriage. That's the temptation of license. To, to presume that God's good design, that his clear commands about marriage, they have no claim on our lives because we're under grace. That because of the gospel, sinning isn't all that bad. Those are the two temptations that we face when we face the reality of what God's word says. 
Two corrective statements briefly on those two temptations. On the one hand, trying to use legal obedience to the law to soothe our conscience, it will never work. It will never work. The law can only ever show us our sin. The law can only ever show us our need for a Savior. It can only ever drive us to Christ. The law can only ever show us our sin. It cannot and will not save us from our sin. The more we try to dig ourselves out through moral effort, the deeper into sin and shame we will get. And on the other hand, the gospel does not change how we define sin. The gospel does not change how we define sin. The gospel does not allow us to minimize or condone sin. The gospel does not change how we define sin, but it does change how sin defines us. And that is because Jesus Christ fulfilled the righteous requirement of the law and because he died the death that we deserve. Because of that, our sin no longer defines us. When we're found in him by faith, our sin no longer has power over us. Our sin no longer condemns us. It no longer enslaves us. We are free. We're freed from it by the power of the Holy Spirit. And that same Holy Spirit now empowers us to obey Christ. Not to save ourselves, but out of a love and a generosity and a gratitude for the grace that he has shown to us. And so the gospel, here's the point, the gospel does not mean that we can reject God's will for our lives. In fact, the gospel actually empowers us to live in, in light of God's will for our lives because we're set free by the power of God's Holy Spirit. And here's what this means for us. It means that within this, dip, this difficult topic, this controversial topic of, of marriage, divorce, and remarriage, we can look at our sin right in its face, in all of its ugliness, acknowledging it for exactly what it is, repenting of it for exactly what it is, because it no longer condemns us and it no longer has any power over us. This is the good news of the gospel. This is the good news of the gospel for our marriages, not legalism, not trying harder and doing better, not licentiousness, not rejecting the law of God completely. The good news of the gospel is the promise of forgiveness through a Savior. The promised forgiveness and freedom of Christ received by faith. Now again, where are we going with all of this? How does this apply to our lives and to the way that we understand marriage it begins by understanding where marriage began. And that is in Genesis chapter 2. All the way back in Genesis 2, we see that it was God himself that created marriage. God himself designed marriage. He said, it is not good that man should be alone. He created Eve. He gave Eve to Adam as a wife. When God created marriage, his good design was that it would be a lifelong, permanent commitment between one man and one woman who would display God's love to one another. That was his design. One man, one woman, in a lifelong, permanent commitment who would display God's love to one another. Now, almost immediately in Genesis 3, something happened. Mankind fell into sin and when that happened, when Adam and Eve sinned, that sin immediately began to attack their marriage. Instead of being loving and committed to one another, they began to blame, they began to accuse one another. Sin had made God's good design for marriage hard and difficult to live out of. There, there was now tension, there was now strife in their marriage and in all relationships. But that difficulty did not change God's good design. And in fact, we read in Exodus chapter 20 that God affirmed, reaffirmed his design for marriage in the seventh commandment, saying, you shall not commit adultery. Marriage is to be a, a lifelong, permanent, faithful commitment between one man and one woman. That's God's good design. That's his will for our marriage, our marriages. And that's what the Pharisees and the scribes were getting wrong here in Luke chapter 16. When they looked at the seventh commandment, 
When they looked at that commandment, which prohibits adultery and, and, and protects the sanctity of marriage, they did not view that law appropriately. And that was the problem. They did not view it as God's good design that was given to them for their good. They saw it as a cold, legal standard that they had to obey in order to justify themselves, but they did not want to. They saw it as a cold, legal standard that they had to obey in order to justify themselves, in order to please God, but they did not want to. Their hearts had not been changed by His grace. And here's the point. When you try to relate to God on, on the basis of your moral obedience to His law as a way to justify yourself, you will always be forced to fudge the numbers, to cook the books, and that is because our sinful hearts do not want to keep the law of God. Our sinful hearts do not want to live out of God's good design for our lives. Our, our hearts naturally do not want that. And so the best that we can do in our sinful flesh is lower the bar. Lower the bar to an achievable level by redefining sin and by redefining obedience. And that is what the Pharisees had done with marriage, divorce, and remarriage. They had redefined sin and they redefined obedience because they were using the law of God to justify themselves. They looked at the standard of God's law, which said clearly, you shall not commit adultery. They looked at that law and realized rightly, well, I guess God requires that I be faithful and committed to my spouse for the rest of our natural lives. They got that part right. But what if I become dissatisfied with my current spouse? The law says that I cannot commit adultery. I must be faithful. Here's what I can do. If all the law of God requires is that I be faithful to my current spouse, that I be faithful to my current spouse, then if I'm dissatisfied with my current spouse, I should write them a certificate of divorce and get a new spouse that I'm satisfied with and will stay faithful to. That way, technically, I'm still obeying. I'm still fulfilling this command and I can stay in the good graces of God. In some corners of first century rabbinic interpretation of the law, it was said that a man could dismiss and divorce his wife for almost any reason. As long as he said that he found some sort of impropriety in her, he could write her a certificate of divorce. If he found someone fairer than her, he could divorce her. If she spoiled his supper, he could divorce her. In some corners of rabbinic Judaism, they had reinterpreted the law of God. They'd reinterpreted sin and they'd reinterpreted obedience. They'd found a way, they thought, to get around God's good design for marriage, to avoid His commandments. And that's what, why what we hear in Luke 16, 17 through 18 is so important for us to understand. Look back there with me. What does it say in verses 17 through 18? Christ says, it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one dot of the law to become void. Everyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. And he who marries a woman divorced from her husband commits adultery. Christ here is taking marriage back to Eden. He's taking it back to Eden. He's reaffirming God's good design, telling us God's law, His design for the good life, has not failed. It has not become void. Not even a dot has passed away. And so he clarifies here God's good design for marriage. Since marriage is meant to be a lifelong, permanent commitment between one man and one woman, to divorce and dismiss your spouse just for any reason at all and marry someone else is not a part of his good design. Divorcing your spouse for any reason at all and, and marrying someone else is not a way to get around adultery. Divorcing your spouse for any reason at all and marrying someone else is not a way to get around adultery. It is adultery. That's what Christ says here. This is to say that all divorce is 
the result of sin. The brokenness that sin has brought into this world. All divorce is the result of the brokenness of sin, but not every divorce is the result of your sin. Not every divorce is the result of your sin. In some cases, you have been sinned against. Here's the biblical reality. God in his mercy, because of the reality and the brokenness of sin in this world, he has provided certain specific allowances or reasons or grounds for why divorce may be permissible. Christ teaches on one of these reasons in a parallel passage in Matthew 5, saying everyone who divorces his wife except on the ground of sexual immorality makes her commit adultery. Everyone who divorces his wife except on the ground of sexual immorality makes her commit adultery. This is one of the biblical grounds for divorce. If your, if your spouse has committed the sin of adultery against you, the Bible affirms that while divorce is never a part of God's good design, that a, a divorce may be permissible in that instance and that correspondingly you may be free to remarry. Another biblical ground comes from 1 Corinthians 7.15 in which Paul explains that a Christian who is abandoned by an unbelieving spouse an unbelieving spouse leaves that Christian, that Christian is allowed to let them go. Meaning if a Christian is sincerely keeping their marriage vows and is committed to their marriage and they are abandoned or forced by their unbelieving spouse to divorce against their will, as Paul says in that passage, the brother or sister is not enslaved. Subordinate to that ground is a, is a form of abandonment, which is broadly defined as abuse. If a husband or wife is abusing their spouse in such a way that it is no longer safe for them or for their children to remain in the marriage, that spouse is breaking their marriage vows. And generally, this is understood to be a form of abandonment. That, that sinful, abusive spouse is oftentimes proving themselves to be an unrepentant unbeliever. And in such an instance, a divorce may be permissible. These are what is broadly understood to be the three biblical qualifications or grounds for divorce, adultery, abandonment, abuse. But what about all the other reasons? We live in an age of broadly permissible, no-fault divorce. And time fails us to go into every single scenario here. We just cannot. But what is clear from Scripture is that divorce just for any reason outside of the biblical grounds is not God's will for your life. It is the result of sin. And so to remarry after an unbiblical divorce is, as Jesus says here, to commit adultery. Now as we come to a close, I want to take some time to make a few more applications to a few different groups of people who may be present. First, to those who have been sinned against in their marriages. To those who've been sinned against in their marriages. To those who, be, who have been committed adultery against. To those who've been abandoned or abused. What, what Christ is saying to you clearly from his word is that what happened to you was wrong. What happened to you was sinful. What happened to you was not your fault. It was the result of your spouse's sin. You are not damaged goods. You are not unlovable. In fact, in Christ, you are beloved by your Father in heaven. In Christ, God has poured out to you the riches of his grace and love, and his grace will continue to be sufficient for you, comforting you, upholding you, directing your heart towards his unfailing love and towards the steadfastness of Christ. Now to those who feel the conviction of being the sinful party in a divorce, those who have committed adultery, those who've been unfaithful or have seen their marriages end because of their sin, those who perhaps hear a sermon like this and they begin to be filled with shame. You need to hear on the one hand that, that redefining and minimizing sin 
will never rid you of your shame. Pretending that what happened didn't happen or burying it deep inside or redefining and reinventing what happened, that won't remove your shame. Legal obedience, trying harder in the next marriage to be a better spouse, that will not remove your shame. Do you know what will, beloved? Forgiveness. The promised forgiveness of the gospel of Jesus Christ is the only antidote for our shame. Receiving and resting upon Jesus Christ alone as he's offered in the gospel. That is what allows us to look at our sin right in the face and repent of it and turn from it. To hear the glorious voice of our Savior say, I know exactly what you did. And I went to the cross for you. I bled for you. I died for you. You are forgiven. Your sin is gone. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so wherever you are this morning in the midst of this difficult topic, no matter how you have sinned, no matter how someone has sinned against you, If you are in Christ and you are standing by faith on his shed blood and his perfect righteousness, you are not defined by how someone has sinned against you. And you are not defined by your sin. You are defined by God's gracious love for you in Christ. And so let us all, let this passage call us to turn from our sin turn from our shame, turn from our pain and regret, and run into the loving arms of our Savior. Amen. Let us pray. Oh, Father, once again, these are hard words to receive. We carry so much pain with us, Lord, relationally. Some of us, if we don't carry the pain of broken marriages, we carry the pain of being the children of broken marriages. We carry that regret, Lord. We, we carry that suffering. And I pray, Lord, that you would be a source of comfort to many this day as they hear that your good design for marriage has not failed and that you are a good father to us, that you have loved us with an everlasting love and that sovereign love can and will, and will heal our broken hearts. Direct our hearts again to your love today, Father. Work in us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.